everyone. Welcome to Decolonizing Place-Based Education. I want you all to know this is a um, collaborative effort by a presenter from Rubenstein School for Environment and Natural Resources, Tarrant Institute of the University of Vermont. I'm from Shelburne Farms and uh, also this is in partnership with Gadokina. We are going to enter into a process of introduction so we can all fully show up in this space together um, as we engage in this process. Um, we are going to model it for you, but first we're gonna give everyone um, a full minute to reflect thoughtfully about what you wanna bring forward. And so here are the three prompts under the umbrella of carrying the past into the future. What is the full name that you carry? Second question is, what are your sacred responsibilities or guiding purpose? That might be just what you see as, as the thing in your life that you are committed and responsible for doing or pursuing. Um, it may be something that you are pulling forward from those that came before you. Um, and the third question is, what are the unique gifts that will help you to do this work and that perhaps are already helping you. Um, and again, that might be something that you're pulling forward from those who came before you. Um, I encourage you to embrace these questions um, in a way that suits you and feels comfortable for you um, and um, true to who you are and for this space. I'll start our one minute reflection now. My name is Adele Amy Altabano Arandia Estensen. Um, I think the, my responsibility is really to meet each person um, that I encounter in my life with an open heart and goodwill. And um, I think the gifts that I have to do that work are gratitude and the ability to listen. My name is Judy Fortin Dow. Um, I think my responsibilities are to our most precious gift in life, that being our children. And my most unique gifts are that I'm really stubborn and I'm artistic. Hi, my name is Marie Cadiz Vea. Cadiz is my mother's maiden name, and Vea is my father's name, and it means way, or um, means the way. Um, I think my sacred responsibilities are to listen and to witness, and my unique gifts that make that possible are humility and vulnerability, um, wanting to ask good questions in good company, and willingness to get lost. My name is Emily Adkins Shepherd Hoyler. Um, Adkins is my mom's maiden name. Shepherd is my father's name. And Hoyler is my husband's mother's name. He was raised by a single mom. Um, I really feel like my sacred responsibility and to borrow some words from a woman named Nicole who I've worked with is to figure out how I can be the medicine um, and then to be the medicine. And some unique gifts that, that help me are my enthusiasm and my curiosity. Uh, we're gonna take you on a, a little kind of um, overview of some key points um, about the tools of colonization and genocide as a way of starting. So we clearly, it, it's a long history and we're not gonna hit on everything, but we wanna just use this tool that you're seeing right now um, to, as a, as a touchstone to talk about a few things. I wanna start with uh, the doctrine of discovery. And this is a series of papal bulls that was written um, in the mid to late 1400s. So 1452, going back to that time. Um, and it was, it being the papal bull was officially written by the Pope. Um, and basically the church said to um, all the European nations in Europe that, you know, go out into the world and whatever lands you land come upon that are not ruled by Christian leaders, um, then you go ahead and take their land and um, consider those people to be less than human. 
Um, so basically it set, set us all up for um, colonization and enslavement and genocide. Um, and again, that's the Pope saying, go ahead, your uh, European Christians, wherever you land, if they're not Christians, you have the right by God to take their land and um, enslaved people. So that is our starting point that we're choosing to start this um, discussion about colonization. Um, and wh what we've done here is we each picked one of these tools of genocide uh, to share with you um, a little bit of history about. And um, I chose eugenics. Um, so eugenics was a formal program that ran between 1925 and 1937 in Vermont. Um, there were programs, eugenics programs in 31 states in this country and all over the world. Um, it was a program that was run, run by progressive thinking people. And their goal was to create um, someone that's better, just like you would a race horse one that goes faster or, or a cow that gives more milk or sheep that have a softer wool. Um, and they did this by identifying people they believed to be defective, dependent and delinquent. And um, these people were often institutionalized or sterilized or both. And um, in all cases, their children were taken from them. They believed that taking their children away would um, break up history and continuity and um, produce a better person for that. Um, it, Adolf Hitler learned a lot about um, eugenics from our scientists, his scientists and the US scientists communicated back and forth. And when Hitler, after he thanked our eugenicists in my conf and in, instituted his program, eugenicists here in this country began to distance themselves and change the titles of their programs to human betterment. And this um, distancing allowed them to operate and stay under the radar until recently. Um, the, the words and the programs you're hearing in the US today and many of the things you're seeing um, today in the US uh, uh, resemble and in copy what was happening in this country in, in the 1920s and the 1930s. And so I just wanted to put that on your radar, give you an idea of what eugenics is, eugenics is and maybe um, you'll notice it more in the news, the words, the deeds, the actions. Maybe you'll see them more often. Um, I just want to give kudos to, to Judy. Um, th this slide is a, um, a compilation of a lot of work and research that Judy had done. And as we were planning this, um, talking and sharing stories about what is going on on this slide, I had chosen forced assimilation. And um, to, to go behind the curtain a little bit, I thought that maybe I could say a little bit about boarding schools, having read a little bit about it in, in my education. And then Judy was generous enough to share this one book, Colonized Through Art. And I read it last night to try to learn up on it and um, got immediately overwhelmed. There are so many stories. And I think what was most, um, what occurred to me was that Forced assimilation is something that perhaps I didn't experience it the way that um, the Native Americans had, but I still I did experience it in some ways um, where having come from a colonized country and coming to the United States and growing up and going to school in a Catholic and Catholic education where I did speak Filipino. Um, I spoke Tagalog and Ilocano in my parents' house until I was six. And then when I started school, um, I was diagnosed with a speech impediment and went to a speech pathologist to have the accent um, erased from my speaking. And I went to a speech pathologist for a number of years. Um, so I lost my language. And um, even now I can't, although I can converse with my family and my mother in English, 
Um, a lot of our family gatherings are spoken in other languages that I don't understand. And so a lot of the experience of being with my family is lost because I don't any longer have the language. And the assimilation also meant that um, going to school was a thing. Um, growing up and getting a great job and contributing to capitalism was a thing. Getting married to a man who is blonde and blue eyed was the thing to go for. And those are pieces that to this day, I'm still trying to deconstruct uh, my way out of. So um, as Judy had said, I, I invite you to think um, how we've all been assimilated into um, the colonizers values um, even now. Thanks. Um, and these tools of colonization and genocide continue into the present day. Um, and we're here today to think about how we can interrupt them as we move into the future. But some of the ways that they show up now are visible in the landscape around us and degradation of the natural world, um, whether it's strip mining, um, water pollution, air pollution. Um, there are so many ways that our extractive relationship with the natural world continues to impose these values of colonization on the land. Um, I also um, have continued to read and learn about this as well. And another present day example of colonization is the erasure of the indigenous people who are still here um, in this land. And I was reading a piece yesterday um, called The Colonization is Not a Metaphor. And it talked about this habit of um, using an asterisk or a parentheses to identify the indigenous people, almost as if there's not enough of them to count. If you look at demographic studies and things like that, and that's another form of erasure and another form of genocide and colonization. Thank you for um, all, of, all of your stories. And, um, and I wanna point out to you that this one little piece of paper can be used in your classrooms. Um, Depending on the ages of your students, you might have to use different words to explain all of these things, but you, it can be done. And you need to also know that you can add to this list. I had constraints um, by the size of the eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, but um, there are many, many more things that you can add to this to continue to look at the land theft and the colonization and genocide that occurred here in this, on this continent. When you're looking at um, the, where you're positioned in the story, take a look back, you know, where did you come from? Where did your family come from? And where am I today? And after looking at the, the tools of genocide, that page of all those things, what actions will you take to change tomorrow? Um, think about that and all the other questions um, equally are as important um, and can promote some amazing discussions that, again, you can do with your students. Let's engage in a little conversation between the, th the three of us around um, how, how we're positioned within the story of colonization and drawing connections from the past to the present and into the future. Um, would anyone like to share? I feel like for me with looking at these three questions, I'm still learning both my positionality within the story and learning about what my actions can look like. And right now my actions are learning and sharing what I'm learning out loud, even if later I might cringe at where, you know, look back and say, oh, that, that's not where I am anymore. But um, just trying to stay with the process. And um, I have a lot of questions about how to show up as a settler colonist and a descendant of settler colonists. Um, and I don't know the answer yet, but I'm gonna just keep showing up however I am and hopefully get feedback <laughs> that, that, um, that helps me grow. I keep learning. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've fully realized that generational trauma that I probably carry with me. I think I'm still just starting to scratch the surface of that. And um, 
I've always kind of struggled with the um, Americanization of Filipino culture as I learned it here from my family and um, felt like incredible tension and, and frustration with it, um, but hadn't really thought of it as a, as a tool and a legacy of colonization until recently. Mm. You know, some questions that have been coming up a lot for me is that um, because this is so up right now, the whole colonization decal and then what indigenization was, was that the next step or something? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is that there's, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that there's interest and an opening up of, of that discourse. And then at the same time, how does it not go the way of like sustainability and diversity where it's, it's claimed and there are experts around it. And then we monetize um, these things because that's just the capitalist way of doing things. Um, it's kind of like what, how land acknowledgement is showing up for me is like, oh, that's a thing to do. And in order to be, um, you know, to, you know, good intentions to, to do the right thing. Um, we haven't done our work yet. I mean, I haven't done my work. I haven't done my work, enough of my work to do that. So, I mean, those are questions that are arising is that how do we really get, the spiral is a beautiful image, but it's also sometimes for me, it feels like I am spinning in, in circles. Mm. Um, so. Emily and I just had a conversation today that I think we had two years ago. <laughs> and we've maybe spiraled a little bit further, <laughs> but it's a tight, tight spiral. It's a spiral up. It's the next level of the staircase. It's just in the same spot again. <laughs> well, I, I like that provocation, Marie, around like, how do we, how do we do this work in such a way that it doesn't become capitalized mm -hmm. um, or a, another act of theft, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe it's by having voices like, like Eve Tux, who's so strong and a little bit like um, intimidating, <laughs> that, that maybe it's those voices that we're gonna need to make sure that that doesn't happen, those kind of protector warriors of the process. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in another conversation with a, with a network today about, you know, we really need to get at the root of our education system and, um, what are our leverage points for change? And then how do we enter into that and not use the same structures of colonial thinking? Mm -hmm. um, it takes vigilance, I'm guessing. Yeah. And I love the words you use, protector warrior. <laughs> mm. When I've used the word warrior in some of my circles, um, some folks go, oh my God, that's like, that's so violent. Why would you use the term warrior? It's like, why can't I use the term warrior? Um, so, because you don't see a little brown person being a warrior, is that why? <laughs> <laughs> so. Or is it because we expect that we can just hold hands and sing and everything will be okay? You know, that I think that there's still a, avoidance of discomfort. And um, I know that when I am feeling discomfort, I'm much more aware of it now. And I actually am much more aware that that usually means I, I'm hitting one of my blind spots. And it's a indicator to me that this is an area I need to grow in. So reading that Eve Tuck piece was very much uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Hi, life. Hey, sorry for being we, so late. I think I, I keep coming back to this realization of like, I always feel like I'm at the beginning, but I know I've been working on this for a while, but I always feel like a beginner. Like there's so much more, I have so many more things to explore, to understand, um, to understand, and then also to be able to act. When I first realized I was white, I thought I, I was there. Like, I was like, oh, I get it now. And I, and for a long time, I thought I got it. And that like, because I made a big shift, but I hadn't yet understood that that was just the beginning. And 
Uh, so I stayed there for a while. And I would say in the last, probably the last five years, more intensely in the last two, I've been continuing more. Yeah, I think the, the inner journey <clears throat> is like just never ending, right? <clears throat> One of my big kind of next frontiers is um, thinking about how I was racialized, socialized, um, that early on, like first through fourth grade or so, I lived with, and then for a few years after that, near my grandmother, who's, who was Japanese. And this was in Lincoln, Nebraska, where there were a lot of Vietnamese immigrants. Um, and so early on, I was sort of, I was racialized by a lot of people as, as being Asian. And, um, and then, you know, as I, you know, interacted with more people who didn't know anything about my cultural heritage, I was perceived as white. And certainly now living in Vermont, like that's, you know, that's how I appear. That's the privilege I carry. Mm -hmm. And so most of my self-work has been exploring that part of me and, and my whiteness and my white privilege, et cetera. Um, and just, just recently, I'm just starting to think about how could I come to terms with the way that I moved, you know, the reasons why um, I moved away, moved towards whiteness in some ways, you know, how it was intentional, how it was kind of part of my community. And so that's, that's like just, I'm just starting to feel like maybe I can do some exploring in that area. Cause up until now, I've just been really like trying to figure out this stuff. Not that I figured it out, but just that, Thank you for sharing life. I'm just getting to know you. I've only like had a couple of conversations with you, but I, I literally had no idea that you had Japanese heritage. Um, we're gonna take a moment just to have a little bit of sharing from a few voices um, about the connections between the historical past that we shared or maybe that you already know of, pulling that into the present and towards a future that we're creating right now. Um, so if you, I'm just going to take a few people. If you'd like to share something, you can either put it in the chat or um, unmute. Um, what came up for me is I'm wondering how I can show up as my best self as an educator and a writer and share this knowledge with others in ways that perhaps I'm not sure. I'm making a, a, an assumption here, perhaps that my ancestors did not. So I want to uh, be a better ancestor to my, to the future. I want to be a better ancestor. Um, I'm going to read from the chat. Just the fear of the other and the dehumanization of people who are different is persistent throughout American history. It's a cycle that requires force of will, education, and compassion to truly break out of. And here's a uh, good question. What does land ownership, quote unquote, look like in a post-colonized future? Like I have more than likely students who have some sort of indigenous heritage and then students who are descendants of European colonizers and then students who are very recent refugees and immigrants from places in post-colonial Africa. And so I think for me, it makes me think about like everyone deserves a relationship to place and has a relationship to place. And needs a chance to explore that and develop it um, for where they're coming from and where they currently live and where they'd like to live. Um, but like that, all the different types of students and backgrounds deserve that. So I, I a lot of my work is um, devoted to questions about place and sense of place and relationship to uh, land and place. And I invite you to take a moment to wherever you are. I don't want to assume that you're all here in Vermont. You may be all over and, and that's a wonderful thing, but to look out your window or at least consider what place is where you are physically and place conceptually. Uh, there was that word of belonging and um, that relationship to place begins with way physically, literally where we're located. And it also has so much more meaning to it. And this image here 
if you hazard a guess, is very close to where a, a number of us live here in the so-called uh, state of Vermont. And this is the watershed that is closest to where I live here um, in Essex. And it might go to, um, as a response to the question that Courtney, hello Courtney, poses in the chat, what does um, land ownership look like in a post-colonist um, future? And it might be that this area, which right now has the boundaries of um, Vermont in the east and New York to the west and then Canada to the north, this is what is so-called Lake Champlain. And imagine though this land without the boundaries before those state and national boundaries and maybe after those state and national boundaries. What would our relationship to place and land look like if there were no boundaries and no naming land and water masses after white colonizers? What would that look like and what would that feel like? Same thinking from another view. Um, you may recognize the boundaries of this map on the edges, but um, there are no, um, none of those political boundaries that we're used to seeing here. So I wanna take a moment for everyone to just look at this and, and put in the chat, what do you see? Um, someone's already noticed drainage basins and watersheds connected, organic, no straight lines. This, this is a map, I'll put a link in there for if you wanna see more. This is a map uh, that an artist constructed and he's done maps um, from all around the world and you can get very, very close to the watershed that you're in. Um, and so I invite you to explore that and maybe use it as a tool uh, with your, your students or whomever you're working with. But I wanna take that idea of uh, dendrites and connective tissue and veins that, that people are seeing here and probe the question a little bit of what if we consider land as a living being that we were living with and what would that shift? And I also wanna just encourage you to take different perspectives, embrace the different ways of looking at our places. Some of you might be very familiar with this slide. Um, these are from the Next Generation Science Standards, um, which the state of Vermont is one of many who has adopted these standards. And I took um, Earth and Space Science um, Natural Resource Standard, and this is it across some of the different grade bands from kindergarten, fourth, middle school, and high school. And and I want you to notice with me the language and the way land is described here. Living things need water, air, and resources from the land. Resources from the land. Humans use natural resources for everything they do. Some resources are renewable over time, others are not. Humans depend on Earth's land, ocean, atmosphere. Um, these resources are distributed unevenly around the planet as a result of past geologic processes. Resource availability has guided the development of human society. All forms of energy production, other resource extraction have associated economic, social, environmental, and geopolitical costs and risks as well as benefits. These, these are things I don't necessarily disagree with, but I think it's really interesting to note the way land is. I, I was really excited about these standards as a classroom teacher because I love teaching children about the wonders of the natural world, but I'm now noticing the way language, the way language positions us in a relationship with the natural world that's extractive and that it exists as a resource to serve us. I see that reflected in these standards. Another way th that I've come to think about relationship to place and land and also how we view our uh, value of knowledge and certain knowledge is this metaphor that I borrow from Dr. Robin uh, Kimmer, where on the left, um, Euro-Western science and colonization is the fortress on the hill. and. Um, where you know the the people who are believed to be the deciders um, know best how to work with the land, um, how to make the decisions 
um, while the, the folks outside of the fortress um, do not have those skills are of less value to some extent. Um, the river metaphor kind of shifts that up a little bit where um, these um, relationship ideas of place and land and also the way that we know place and land might be different knowledges that might live alongside each other. And maybe as they go down this river in separate boats, maybe collaborate with each other um, when it is of use and when it makes sense, but for the most part live autonomously and then the, the third um, idea is to coexist um, and have be in relationship with land as a garden might. Um, and perhaps many of you know about the three, three Sisters Garden, which is a symbiotic and synergistic relationship amongst these species. And it's um, a full meal. Um, it is rich and um, it, it is very high quality. So what would it look like if our relationship to place and our relationship with the land and each other is more synergistic because we respect all the different ways that we might be in relationship with place? Um, for us, uh, the aqui, the soil, the, is the center where birth begins. Um, it's the birthing place. Uh, my language, my Abeniki language has been um, taken from me. Uh, my first language is French. I can't even wrap those, my tongue around those words, but I put them here for you. Uh, the next circle is the community, uh, the spine of the land. It's the place where the animals, the birds, the fish, the plants, the humans, all form a spine for the land to work together for the soil. And then the band lands are the watershed, the place where everybody works together um, to protect the waters that come from the watersheds uh, to produce water for the spine, for all those in the community. Um, and then the nation's land is connected with um, the bigger place where everybody speaks the same linguistic group. And, um, and they might have similar um, governments and similar beliefs, but language ties them all together. And Gedakina is our world, our worldview on all the other circles below and how, how we connect all those things and connect them with other cultural groups as well. well we wanna um, ask you to think in three as we have three questions for you here. Um, and this is really a continuation of the conversation that's already happening in the chat, but we wanted to give everybody a little think time to sit here for a minute and consider that if we think of Earth as a resource, where does that lead? If we consider land as family, how would you treat her? And if we as a community held the land as our family, what would or could happen? So just sit with those questions for a moment and then share out in the chat what's coming up for you as you reflect on this. Refer to the land or planet as mother nature to fortify the family aspect. A resource when you think of it is how can I use it or take advantage of it? What does it have to offer me? And when it's a family, you wanna take care of it. Uh, it makes me think about the mindset of all my relations. Some more comments about resources feeling like a one-sided taking Nurture, tend, respect, reciprocity, and it would be a new kind of love. Hmm. I do want to highlight this one because it's something that has been a part of our conversations um, for this entire topic. Um, it, I think it's important to think about how formerly enslaved people might consider this question. And I deeply appreciate that that's been surfaced. That's been um, one of our touchstones and kind of um, edges for us in our discussions about this topic. Okay, so embracing that idea of non-closure, we're gonna move forward um, and we wanna think about um, kind of tools for, for acting on decolonization. And we're coming back to this two vessels metaphor that Marie brought forward from Dr. Kimmerer. Um, with the question, how do we learn? Um, so one of the things that we did together as a group is think about 
um, how does colonization translate to practices and structures and cultural values in our educational process and experience? This is not specific to any teacher <laughs> or experience, but kind of a collection. So I wanna start um, by asking you again to look at this and just type in, what do you see without judgment? What do you, what do you see that's being presented here? And I invite you to do this as a way of looking at something with a lot of detail in a shared way. I can just say that looking at the two sides, one just calms me and fills me with kind of peace and hope. And the other makes me like want to make a list and hurry up and get something done. So it's very interesting, just kind of their emotional response to the two. Uh, I would uh, agree with that. I think one feels like upholding white supremacist culture and the other feels like a deeper connection that maybe we may not have experienced in a long time or if at all. So what I'm gathering from you all is that these things inform strongly about how we experience learning, whether that's in school or, or beyond school. I wanna pose the question about how do we meet in the middle or what common values could hold the center for all of us? And then moving on, Emily, I'm gonna offer a suggestion that what if these six R's um, could be the values that, that we center? So respect, reciprocity, reverence, responsibility, relationships, and relevance in our relationship to place and education, so in place-based education. So the, this is rich and I really appreciate all of the, the comments in the chat. And um, I really, um, I love some of the words that I've heard, you know, our learning edges, learning, unlearning and relearning. And um, it, it occurs to me and it occurs to us that um, to acknowledge that um, for me, colonizer his, settler history does impact me. Um, it impacts my choices often unconsciously. And it also impacts my educational practices, um, how I, the resources I use, the people I, I, I reach out to, um, the, the history that I choose to share, how I speak with my students. Um, and I aspire to a place where um, multiple worldviews and ways of knowing um, are acknowledged by me as an educator and a learner, and that those multiple ways of knowing and worldviews can be in collaboration and in service to a just and sustainable world. And also an, an acknowledgement and awareness that learning is a spiral process. We come back, we go around, we meet again, and then we spiral out again. Um, it's that process of learning, unlearning, and relearning. Um, which is exactly what I have experienced in working with my beloved colleagues um, in this presentation. So we start with ourselves. That's the necessary place, the place right here, right where I am, right here, right now. And it's self-reflection. What is it? Um, where have I come from? What is my, what do I understand to be uh, where I'm located in the world? Um, a lot of self-talk. Um, and then growth with trusted others. And, you know, I can use the lab of um, Amy and Judy and Emily and I working through putting together this uh, presentation where we've done our, some, of, some work um, um, before coming together. And then in the process of thinking through this presentation, we came to, I came to my edges and I asked questions with people that I trust. And the beautiful thing is that I trust these folks because their intentions were the same as mine. So growth with people and with more than human um, beings that have um, that intention at the center, um, love and trust. And then spiraling out from there, taking that growth and learning within um, a community and also across communities where there might, um, we might have or grow more surface area to hold these questions. And these are tough questions. And the self-reflection, um, there's a challenge there and building the capacity to learn, unlearn and relearn within communities and across communities uh, begins to transform the world.
Um, so I know I'm really grateful for the opportunity in this space and hopefully continued opportunities to do that spiral, spiraling, um, learning, unlearning and relearning uh, with trusted others. So takeaways, um, we're gonna leave you with some questions and some thoughts and ideas. Um, how am I a part of the past story of colonization? Did, do I understand the current story of colonization? What actions will I take with my students to stop the ongoing colonization of land? These questions should help you. They, I, we've kind of looked at them as gifts, a gifts for you to take away, to try to figure out, to try to use with your students, to figure out how you might bring action to your classroom. It might be something like, simple as learning to pronounce children's names correctly or renaming streets or changing monuments or um, anything within your communities, within your school that doesn't seem to quite fit. Um, if you take action, do the research, investigate, take action, that is a form of decolonizing. Writing a land acknowledgement is a form of decolonizing. It's a journey to write a land acknowledgement. There's research that has to go um, be done um, before you can write a land acknowledgement. And it's part of reconciliation to enter into a land acknowledgement is an agreement that you recognize this land is stolen. So any little action you can bring to your classroom um, to allow your students to go on a journey with you to make um, change is is a, a gift and we want you to take um, this away with you as a gift. Thank you. We've we've shared a lot. We've asked a lot of you to engage in these challenging questions um, that are unsettling and they're intentionally unsettling because that is what is required of us. Um, but we're also asking you to spiral forward. Given that we're all in process, we invite you to hold yourself accountable. Um, what will be your next step? I'm going to put my commitment out there in terms of I'm going to continue to hold space for educators who are interested to, to explore and build understanding about what decolonization and unsettling might mean for them individually and for us collectively. That's my commitment. And I invite um, Judy, Marie, and Emily, if you'd like to share as well. I share that commitment, Amy. Hopefully some of those will be in partnership with this team again. Um, I commit to keep asking questions and learning and bringing what I'm learning to my work and sharing it and sharing my messy process and to keep having the courage to get it wrong and still show up. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, I'm, I'm, I'm chuckling at your thought because it's, it's so hard to, to stay on this um, journey and, um, and I'm um, hoping to continue to share knowledge that will help people to continue their personal journeys. And um, I'm excited to continue to learn um, from you as we um, continue journeys learning. I'll echo that. I, I feel so grateful to be part of this um, dynamic quadro, um, thinking about these. And um, I'm going to harken back to, I think I, I my next step is, um, I'm in that spiral place around land acknowledgement. And it. Um, I found myself being able to ask good questions um, vulnerable questions with this group. And so I think I need, I, not I think, I know I need to do some deeper research. Um, and when I say that I'm connected to this land and this place, what do I really mean? And what do I really know about it? Um, and I see there's more sharing happening. Um, there 
There's a lot for all I'm going to say. There's a lot for me to keep learning, and there are a lot of resources out there. So thank you for everyone for sharing. But also, I have deep gratitude for everyone's commitment for showing up in this space as a learner, um, and also holding this space with us, um, so that all of us can make ourselves a little bit vulnerable and lean into the discomfort of learning important and challenging um, things about ourselves and our and our shared experience.